So, yeah, I'm Kirsty. I've been parachuted in from daytime woman to woman, so it's lovely to, to see you this evening. Um, and it's June. We have made it. Summer is here, officially. Um, students, it's another year's ticked off. Graduates, you've done it, you've made it. Teachers, your well-deserved rest is coming. Um, <laughs> workers, you can get home in the sunshine, you can have barbecues after work, life is good. Uh, parents, your tired, grumpy children are almost finished another term. You can look forward to a summer of blissful family fun <laughs> where everyone is happy all of the time. <laughs> or not. Um, but before you get stuck into the summer fun and put your out of office on, imagine you have one final paragraph, just 200 words to write to a group of close friends who are under huge pressure and stress. What would you say? Throughout our studies in Thessalonians, we have seen Paul's love, care and encouragement for the young persecuted church in Thessalonica. So what message does he want to leave ringing in the ears of the church as they hear this letter read aloud? As you've seen in your groups, Paul focuses on relationships. When life is hard, relationships matter. It's a new church, people working together for the first time, surrounded by a culture with a very different worldview and facing persecution. You may not have faced all of that, but I expect you may have felt the joys of connecting with a new friend in a new city, or felt the care and support of a long-time friend when you're going through a time of grief, or felt the pain of loneliness when friends are far away. Paul addresses the brothers and sisters. That means the whole church. So, if you are a church member or come to church regularly, he is talking to you. As 12 to 13 first deal with relationships with leaders in the church. There's lots written about leadership in the Bible. There are examples of good and bad leaders, there are qualifications for leaders, and there are letters written to instruct church leaders. Here we have advice for how Christians should respond to their leaders in church. Maybe the Thessalonians found it hard. They saw what Jason was like before he became a Christian. How dare he tell them what to do? Comparison and criticism can often come much easier than submission and respect. But Paul says that the leaders have authority from God. They care for you in the Lord. They work hard and should have that work respected and acknowledged. We should love them and respect them and aim to make their lives easier by living at peace. How helpful is it when someone sees your work and says, well done? How much easier does it make your life when your kids or pupils or friends or colleagues aren't bickering and gossiping? It allows you to focus on the job at hand. Let's recognise the leaders at the brothers. Let's thank Karen for all her work doing woman to woman. Let's message our home group leaders to say a thank you for the hospitality and care. Let's pray for our elders as they make big decisions. Um, and let's, among ourselves, seek to avoid gossip and resolve differences among ourselves rather than complaining and bickering. Then we move on to verse 14 and 15 and look at relationships with each other. The church is full of different types of people with different struggles and different needs. And Paul speaks to these different needs. Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. And with all of this, seek to be patient and seek to do good. Patience and kindness to each other is like the glue that holds these relationships together, even under pressure. It doesn't sound easy. As we seek to do good to one another inside the church and to everyone outside the church, this is part of the wit our witness and evidence of the reality of faith in Christ. Remember, this is written to the whole church. Everyone has a role to play. We need to invest in relationships so we can get to know people and how to help. Some people might be physically weak, and need practical help with meal preparation or gardening. Some people might be living with anxiety or fear and need encouragement. Some people might not be using their time productively and need a caring rebuke. I'm an introvert. I feel overwhelmed on a Sunday morning thinking about who to speak to or what to say, but I benefit hugely from relationships at church. You help me, you rebuke me, you encourage me, and I need it. We then look at our relationship with God. During times of pressure, whether busyness, stress, grief, physical health challenges, mental health challenges, it's easy to forget about God and allow despair to take over our thoughts. Maybe you don't have time to pray. Maybe you don't have the energy to read your Bible. But in the midst of persecution, Paul tells the Thessalonians to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is the will of God. That's the big question, isn't it? What is God's will for your life? Whatever the circumstances, we have joy, prayerfulness, and thanksgiving. Easy? Well, maybe that's why the next sentence is, do not quench the Spirit. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the helper. 
It is his power and work in us that produces fruit. We cannot by ourselves produce joy in times of suffering, no matter how hard we try. Paul exhorts that we guard against anything that could put out the flame of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How do we do that? We are thoughtful. We hold firmly to the good of God's word and stay away from the lies of sin. Paul's final prayer is one of encouragement and assurance. Themes that are repeated throughout the letter. He appeals to God himself, the God of peace, a close God who we can have a relationship with. He asks that God will sanctify them and that their whole beings, spirit, soul and body, be kept blameless and reminds them of the certainty of Jesus coming again and the faithfulness of God. We can have a personal relationship with God who changes our lives and keeps his promises. As Paul signs off the letter, we see the importance of their relationship with him. Paul asks for, the, his, Paul asks for their prayers. He needs their partnership. He wants all the church to know that he cares for them. He greets them and wants to ensure that they all hear this letter. And he finishes how he started the letter. He commends them to God's grace. I've been struck as we've studied this letter by Paul's obvious love and care for Thessalonians. He is in a way in, in daddy Paul mode. He treats them as a father talking to beloved children. I counted 12 times that he addresses them as brothers and sisters. There's thanksgiving, encouragement, instruction, and so much more we could delve into and cross-reference and get excited about, but I restrain myself. Um, so I hope that as you go into this summer season, whatever that holds for you, you will hear Paul's words from Thessalonians ringing in your ears. Throughout the book, we've seen that the gospel is true and powerful. How you live matters. Relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ matter. Jesus is coming back, so be encouraged. And because of the grace of God, we can rejoice whatever the circumstances.